Hey, 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 everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome to GMI Hub Online. Tonight is Studio Talk Night, and we are so thrilled. We have some returning panelists that are, are here with us, um, and we are going to be talking about live streaming for churches. But we're going to go on the tech side tonight. We're talking about tech and we're talking about best practices. But before I go on to that, I'm going to say this. If this is your first time with us, I encourage you to check out all our videos. Well, watch this one first, but check out all our videos and feel free to hit the like and the subscribe button if you enjoy what you're going to be hearing tonight and be the first ring the bell so you can be the first to learn about when we are going to be broadcasting again. Also, if you want to know about GMI Hub online, please go to our website, gmihub.ca, where you will find out about all the different projects that we are working on and even some of the shows that are upcoming as well. We are also on social media, so feel free to follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter as well. And I think we're also on uh, TikTok. So feel free to check us out on there as well. But before I continue further, I want to introduce my co-host and my husband, Daryl Duick. Hey, Daryl. Hello. How are you? Good to be here tonight. Good. And beside me, just off a little bit, is our oldest guy. He's going to be switching for us tonight. So it'll be a fun night watching uh, our, our young guy or our older guy trying to uh, help along tonight to do our show. So best practices part of what we're trying to do is create mentorship and talent growth so that's what we're doing we're starting off with one of our guys let's introduce our panelists tonight i just want to i'm so glad we have our returning panelists like they were here back in january talking about the do's and don'ts of live streaming but tonight they're back to talk about the tech of live streaming we want to welcome tyler rotsart from ottawa he's uh handles the tech at uh Bethel Church in Ottawa. I want to uh, also John Bedell from no Niagara Falls. He is the founder of Niagara Online uh, Worship, and he handles and helps a lot of churches in the Niagara region with their live streaming. And Martin Sutton, who handles the live streaming for a, a church in Toronto called Destiny and Dominion. Welcome, gentlemen. So glad to have you here with us. Thank you. You. Say hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's start this conversation. Daryl, your first question. Well, it's not so much a question, but I'm going to start off with, um, I keep getting phone calls and emails going, hey, we're wanting to upgrade our cameras. We're about 100 feet away from the stage, um, and we have to be at the back of the room, and we want to get a medium to medium tight shot, and our budget is 1000 to $1,200. I always say, you can't do it at that price point. You need to look to go into some older technology or move the cameras up. What do you guys think for recommendations for using uh, video gear for that? For cameras, we'll, we'll pick on the cameras. What's your opinion on cameras, 100 feet away from the stage? I can list cameras that cannot absolutely do that at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know what? I'll risk it. So Sony's signal noise ratio hasn't gotten better over the last 20 years, so I'd stay away from that. Um, Black Magic, they've gotten marginally better in my view, but I'd stay away from them, and I'm going to talk a lot of whatever about them later on. But yeah, uh, Daryl, yeah, I know what you have in your quote-unquote warehouse. So yeah, an older 480 camera at, where you can run the conversion, stuff like that. Yeah, um, too many people think that you have to immediately make the jump to 1080p. I had someone who destroyed a laptop because they were trying to render on a regular laptop. They're trying to render 4K video. Um, just because technology is new does not mean you have to use it. Um, sometimes it's it's not just cost prohibitive. It's just like you lack the know-how. I was trained on that older style 480 equipment. And I turned out okay, so people can use it and start from there. Tyler, what do you uh, recommend for a situation like that? I'd start by moving cameras up first, so you get a better depth of field. Um, and you're not all the way at the, the bottom or the top of your lens. Um, but at that point, I would be looking into something 
a little older if I had to purchase brand new or newsed. Um, you don't need 1080 to live stream. Most people watch it on a cell phone or a tablet that's really only going to receive 720 at best. So kind of hitting that mark uh, would be where I would look at. And then it also helps with bandwidth on, uh, on the output as well. Okay. And John, what do you recommend? Well, Tyler, Tyler's right. 720 is perfectly adequate. So I do have one church that had a, a kind of a similar thing. Their approach was a little different. They actually bought a fairly inexpensive 4K camera that allowed them to um, use a little more digital zoom. I don't like digital zoom. I'd, I'd rather go optical. But their solution, um, it was fairly inexpensive, and, and they actually had decent success with it. So that's one thought. The other thing is is there's nothing wrong with buying used um, if if the if a camera that'll reach 100 feet out is beyond your means, try and find the the equivalent product um, on the used market, and and you might find that uh, that that solves the problem for you. Okay, so now because we are still talking about cameras, what is the recommended for I'll call it the average church, probably 50 feet away from the stage? What's what's the go-to right now? What are people recommending, and what? I guess, what is the camera and what's a uh, going price point of that? And did, I guess, yeah, we'll start off with that. We'll go with those cameras. John, since you started last, we'll go with you. Okay. Um, I like the Canon XA series myself. Um, not everybody likes the Canon optics. I do. Um, I find I have good luck with that. Um, I use the XA series because it has XLR inputs. So if I need to go mobile, that gives me a little bit more flexibility. The G series, the G50 is actually optically pretty much the same camera without the XLR inputs. So it's a little bit cheaper. Um, I think they're in the 12 and $1,300 range and the uh, the XA, well, the last one I bought was an XA11 and it was uh, around 16, 16, 50. I've had good luck with those and, and I like them because they have the, uh, the LAN C connection. So it allows you to, to control the zoom nice and clean when it's mounted on a on a tripod um, so that's my preference for a for a manually operated cameras okay um tyler what about you recommended cameras. so i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna go a little higher price range here from where john was at uh, my recommended for most churches would be a panasonic uh, i've been really liking the new agcx 350s uh, mostly because of their functionality. Uh, you can push NDI directly out of them. You have to buy a license to do it, so that's an added expense. They do have SDI output, HDMI out. Uh, you can stream direct to YouTube from them. So for a church that maybe wants to step up into a higher quality camera but needs more feature set, it offers a lot. Uh, I'm also supporting, if you buy the right lensing, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinemas are nice. And then higher up from there, we won't even get into because it's more than most churches yearly budgets. <laughs> okay, and Martin, your recommendation for cameras? Well, I'm actually biased towards the Panasonic CX350. We have two. Um, uh, I think it's the CX10 is also a viable alternative. It's a bit lower down on the range. Um, both of them have NDI, um, which is a big thing especially when you have stuff like you can spend a bit more on your camera and a bit less on the software with NDI because then you can bring it into OBS and some other things, even ProPresenter receives NDI. Um, so I go there. I wasn't seeing pe Canon. It would be my second pick um, for that entire setup. But, so we go Panasonic then Canon um, for the reasons that the guys gave. Okay. Um, so we've been talking about, I guess, uh, hand operated cameras. What about robotic cameras? Do you recommend the robotic cameras? Do you use them? What do you think of them? I would actually recommend the pan. Uh, I would recommend a robotic camera actually might be an alternative. If you can sort of squeeze it into your budget for that. Oh, we, a lot of times people are thinking, oh, we can't get on the ground to get that shot. They're too far away. If you can mount the camera sufficiently high enough, but still level, you can get a bit closer to your stage and it gives you a bit more opportunities that way. Um, typically, robotic cameras wind up being a bit of a false, uh, force multiplier because 
two guys, three guys, well, two guys can run four or more cameras. And then one person running the switcher, one's positioning the cameras, and you're just working away at it. Okay. Um, but I'm a bit more of a classic guy. Each person has their own camera and just works at it. Okay. Um, John, what about robotics and you? I, I use, uh, I, I definitely, I, I'm a big proponent of, of at least one. Um, because you can set up the presets with a push of a button. You can set the camera exactly where you want it. Um, having said that, if your setup is just one camera, I wouldn't go with a, a PTZ just because they, they're not smooth moving um, until you get, a, I guess, maybe into the really expensive ones. Um, but if you've got a multiple camera setup, uh, certainly one of them being a PTZ gives you lots of flexibility, um, allows you to control things. I mean, most of the time, um, I'm running it solo, so running three cameras, nope. lots of flexibility. Okay, and uh, Tyler? Uh, yeah, I absolutely support using PTZ cameras. We actually have a pair of PTZ optics 30 times. Um, great cameras. If you're looking to add a second or a third camera but worried about finding volunteers, a PTZ is definitely the way to go and you can mount them pretty much anywhere um as long as you can deliver power and video whatever your video signal of flavor is um yeah they're they're a great purchase and a good investment in the long run okay so hey, hey other... daryl just just one one more thought about the ptz's yep. while, while you're on that um it's worth uh mentioning that if you're going to run a ptz particularly a big one like a, a 30 times that he was just talking about make sure it's mounted rock solid um too many churches have them mounted on the front of the balcony you get somebody walking around in the balcony the camera actually shakes and of course the bigger the zoom is the more sh the shake so a ptz mounted at the back of the church make sure it's mounted somewhere absolutely dead solid not on the door frame or, or um you know above a door that's going to open and close uh, so just Sorry, just a little supplementary thought there on PTZs. Actually, that's a great segue because I was going to ask. That's something that keeps coming up into uh, my email when they're asking about that is how do we stop the camera shakes? What have you guys <laughs> done? I'm not going to ask each individual. What have you guys done to stop the cameras from shaking? Tell yeah, people uh, not to run around the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> my, my first method is it starts with my camera riser. I don't build a solid riser. My riser is hollow underneath and my side panels are hollow as well, which allows the low end to pass through. Um, and then for anything mounted in our facility, we've actually mounted uh, between the bracket and the camera, we mount a rubber washer. And then that way that absorbs some of the, uh, the shake. Have any of you guys actually thrown sandbags or weights on the uh, spreaders of the cameras to uh, just make bigger mass, more mass? No. Okay. So <laughs> I will actually get, here's a little trick. Well, it's not little. Um, the recommendation is you always start off at the foundation. So some of the older churches, their wood floors, you got to find out how you support that wood flo that that floor, make it solid, um, and then you always split the camera r from the person who's standing on it, so that they don't step on the riser, shake the camera. Um, I love the idea of making sure that there's air gaps, that they're kind of like what Tyler was saying. Um, the next thing is, is we've actually I've been known to, especially if you're using stage decks, ratchet strap the four legs around one uh lengthwise and then you also go over the top and underneath and you strap it all together so it doesn't move and then we've thrown about 500 pounds of sandbags so the riser doesn't move and then we've also put again depends on what tripod it is but you also then put weight on the bottom of the tripod where the spreader comes together in the middle if it's a uh, mid-length mid-height spreader just to keep mass so it doesn't shake so, word of advice, mass, that stops the shake. <laughs> yeah, that's a good... <laughs> uh, and the other of... thing to... Go ahead, Mark. The other thing to stop the shake, maintenance. 
Sometimes it's as simple as maintenance. I, I won't tell you how many times I thought I was going to have to scrap something, and then I'm like, oh, no one's maintained this thing in 10 years. Let me just pull out a Torx wrench and just tighten it up. Yep. So. Hmm. Yep. Constant wear, pan and tilt. Yep, definitely. Cheryl, you were going to say something. I was going to say, it's so good to learn about how to keep things from not shaking, but I wanted to take a break learning about all these, these trucks to take a break for a, a special message, commercial message. Are you writing a Christmas song? Do you want it on our Christmas CD? This year, send us your song for your chance on the CD. Submission deadline, July 31st, 2022. Family Christmas Volume 3, Christmas 2022. All right, so if you know anybody who's writing songs or if you know some tech people that want to send in some music, you know where to send it, gmihub.ca. Back to you, Daryl. Sounds good. Okay, so we were briefly talking about cameras. Do you guys have anything else to mention before we move on? Uh, I guess only on the recording front, just try and standardize, like having I have old Sony cameras that record to CF cards. I have SD cards that I record on. And yeah, like try and standardize so you're, so you're not having to have adapters at the wazoo. Um, yeah, that's... Same frame rate as well versus 720 versus 1080p versus 4K, 720.997 and, you know, 24 uh, frames. Th there's that. And then... Do you don't want to be locked in because you chose well it goes back to what you choose i have cameras where i'm running into my switcher 1080i because that's what the first two cameras were but all the other cameras can do 1080p so right 1080p being the better standard so okay so uh, since we're talking about what we're running into in the record do we want to go into switchers and record stuff or do we want to jump into audio for a bit Doesn't matter to you guys. Let's work down. <laughs> nope. Let's work down the uh, the signal path. Let's okay. go. Uh, let's go switching and processing. Okay, switching and processing. Uh, I'm just gonna say one name. And I, Cohen, do you want to put up the three guys? Uh, let's see their faces as I say Black Magic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll take the hit, Tyler. I'll take the hit. All right. So Black Magic. Black Magic is great if you have a limited budget and you can't af you can't afford the high-end stuff but at the same point truck it's what we said i wasn't going to mention a name until later last time black magic is the is the developer they can break at any point in time at the same point i have some of their equipment that has lasted me for 12 years um i'm looking at uh atem television studio their very first product and i have two inputs on it that are dead um other than that it's great um and it's and 12 have, years old it's 12, it's 12 years, old. years old i've tried to retire it several times i keep having to put it back into service um yeah uh and that's what they started off with and it was great because that was that was a switcher that you could actually stream from you just plug that into your mac you plug it into a pc as long as it had enough cpu and all the computers are out there now all have enough and you could go to livestream.com. Well, now you can go to um, Vimeo as well. But yeah, it was great. You could just drag it in and go. Um, but yeah, then you also have to think about, are you switching for live or are you switching for recording? Um, are you searching for people who are within the audience who can see what's going on? Or are you switching for people who are watching online? So like Tyler can get away with NDI switching I can't at my facility. I need, I need, I need to process faster than that. Then I can't deal with that delay. Um, like just for me, I'm watching myself on the screen, and I'm like, 
I made that movement. My lips aren't matching what I'm actually saying. That's the kind of delay that people would be dealing with. And yeah, it's kind of hard to process. You have to filter it out. I'm going to let someone else talk for a second while I check something. <laughs> All right, so there definitely is a time and a place for black magic. Um, if if that's what your budget can afford, then that's what you get. Um, if you can afford more, like Panasonic, Sony, Ross, um, Grass Valley, Grass Valley. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, <laughs> that's what you buy there. But also, you can look at in-the-box switching solutions like uh, VMix, OBS. Uh, Tricaster, I would say, would be pretty in the box. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and looking at it from number of inputs you need, number of layers you need, and what features you're really looking for and what you want to do. Do you want to be able to do uh, keying layers? Do those keying layers need to be switchable? Um, what kind of inputs do you need? And it, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a world and a dark rabbit hole that you can go down for a very, very long time picking what switcher is going to be right for yourself. Correct. John, There's which... many wrong answers oh. is right. Um, <laughs> hey, Daryl, so before yeah. John talks, Daryl, uh, check the chat for a sec. Uh, I'm not getting it on my... For some reason, no I'm not is. getting it. Okay. Um, well, chat is basically, are we streaming? Okay. Yeah, I my unit says it is, and I'm trying to figure out why it's not. So that's kind of why I'm a little stuttering about this. So I will okay. dig into that. So keep going. We'll just okay. keep going. If it doesn't go, we'll stick it up right afterwards. We'll upload it and send her out. First world streaming problems. Yep. <laughs> so what makes a good stream? Getting it online. Getting it to go. <laughs> Hey, it, it, that this is actually like the perfect moment because everybody's human. Things do happen, and at the end of the day, when things do happen, just keep going. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, John, back to you. Sorry for cutting you off. No, no problem. Um, so, black magic. My objection to black magic is is even the like the the black magic the the mini pro. Um, as far as just switching ATI inputs for the price, you really can't beat it. Um, my objection is to do anything sophisticated, you still need to have a computer hooked up to it running the software to run macros and all of that. So like the Mini Pro, they tell you you can stream directly out of the Mini Pro. But it's not really an independent device if you're doing anything sophisticated. You still need the computer to, to do things um, with the Mini Pro, so I, I, not not a huge big fan unless you're you're very simple, straightforward switching. In which case, it's it's a brilliant piece of equipment for the for the price you pay. Um, when I started doing live streaming in churches, I was doing it on a mobile basis, so I was actually using an old uh, Roland VR five, um, which was standard definition, but it had the audio inputs as well, um, and and basically had a, an audio mixer built in. When I went to HD, I went to a Roland VR4, which is this, a similar device. Um, it's an all-in-one that has uh, fairly decent sound control as well. Um, but to be honest, I, I have switched over now, and I'm, I'm running straight in vMix and doing all of the camera switching right in vMix. Um, the computers are fast enough, and, and uh, like I'm not running 4K or anything. It's just full HD, and, and uh, the, the computer is fully capable of doing all the switching, so I'm not using a hardware switcher at all anymore. Ah, okay, so let's, because now we've talked about a switcher that nobody really likes, even though a lot of people like them because they're great for the <laughs> bang for the buck. I've yeah, got mine. Me mine for a second. Yep. I got two of them here. <laughs> like, Switch to the mark. And I got, I got two there, and then I got, well, some people might know what that is. So yeah, I, I have them, but I do know that there's issues, and it's like plan for plan for failure. Yep. <laughs> yep, and that's just part of what it, what that is. Now we've been talking about in the box and out of the box, or hardware based switchers like the the Black Magics, the Ross, the Grass Valleys, Panasonics, and VMix and OBS, which are the two really bigger ones. What's the big difference, and why would you use one f versus uh, a software based versus a hardware based. All right, I'm gonna quote 
I can't remember his name. He worked for Panasonic, and it's the Cairo switcher. And he basically said, where you crap out with the hardware-based switchers is everyone always wants more input. So they want more so that they can paint their image. Software-based, so the Kairos, the OBS, the vMix, it's how much can the computer system handle? How much can it take in? Um, and a lot of these things, a lot of the hardware-based switchers are actually just computers. They're just, they're field programmable units, but they're still computers underneath it all. It's just you're a bit more limited on what you can do with it. Um, I like the hardware base because sometimes there's software hangups, other stuff that goes on, and then I'm the only one who can sort it out. So it's like, it's easier for me to train someone on how to debug or like work through the issues when it's hardware based than having them go into the system and try and figure out what line of code went wrong. So that's why I lean towards hardware versus software. Tyler, I'm sure you have an opinion on hardware versus software. <laughs> oh, I buttons all day for me all day long. Um, <laughs> I would rather have a hardware switching device, but it it really comes down to, I think, what you want to do with it. Like, do you need to be able to do camera in room? If you don't, maybe a software switching platform is more economical for you. Uh, computers are pretty cheap these days. We're getting cheaper. We'll see how the market goes in the next six months. Um, and with if all you the lack carts, of chips, with all the lack of chips, yeah. hardware might be um, might be cheaper. Hardware switching may be cheaper at that point because then you just need a laptop to encode. But again, that itself can be a strenuous process. So I'm torn between the two. And I can't make up my mind which one I would prefer because I think they both have their place in different scenarios. Okay. John, do you have an opinion? I do. Um, I, I like buttons. I'm, I'm an old guy, so I like an actual tactile hardware device. The reason that I went to a software base was because um, essentially I'm running sound, video, and projection solo at the, at the church. So I wanted to be able to run everything on a single stream deck. And because everything is, is computer based, I can, on, on the single stream deck, screen i can do all my camera switching i can do the overlays i can control the pan tilt zoom camera all on on the stream deck um, whereas if i was running i realized if i was using a, uh, certain hardware switchers i could control them with the uh, with the stream deck as well um, but the way i've got it configured is is it was it was simple um, and it allows me to run it solo. So that was why I went to the, the software based solution was just because it, it allowed me to configure everything through the stream deck. Okay. So we've been talking about, we like buttons, but is hardware about the buttons or is it about having everything built in hardware? Because I can buy buttons for vMix. I can use my keyboard. There's the stream mm -hmm. decks. So at a certain point, there's no difference. It's the type of buttons, is it not? It, there's, there's a bit of the type there's a bit of type of buttons it's also the fact that okay it, it's like some people you have to train them that the k is going to be this or w is going to be that or whatever whereas with the hardware it's like i said it was like showing right there on the on the face panel that camera five is live and six is in preview and there's an entire joke about that because what's actually going on right there it's like it's showing one thing but it's recording something else um so there's that bit, there's a bit more resiliency with the hardware. Um, at the same point, the software, the software is actually a bit, in its own ways, a bit easier to get into, especially if you start like, oh, we need a stream. You can start with OBS, so you're not paying for the software. Um, and there's a whole lot of add-ons and stuff like that you can do with OBS and build up from there. Um, and, and a lot of people think, oh, you, can, you don't really get to do any real switching or whatever. You can't really preview. And it's like, no, there's a whole lot that OBS can do. Or you can even do, um, you can do multicam. And you can, like, have, like, the this, the display, like, how Pro, um, Blackmagic Design has. I actually have to laugh because I was figuring John, John was of the school that I remember where it's like, when I said I went to buy, I had to go buy a Blackmagic Design, whatever. It's like, you, you got to go buy what? We're a church. Why are you buying Blackmagic? Um, but yeah, it's the software, 
the software does give you a bit of flexibility. There was one point in time where I was like, okay, I want to build a vMix system and whatever, but then I'll, realizing that there's that latency within the building um, isn't going to work. But if you're just doing pure live streaming, then yeah, software might be software might work. It might be a bit better than trying to go hardware based. Is there a difference for the generations who are using equipment, whether it's hardware or software? So we have a 13 year old who is growing up on software versus him trying to get into the hardware versus the older generations using hardware, trying to learn the software. If you're working with volunteers or staff, is there a difference with that? I think it's easier to train someone on hardware and transfer them over to software than going the opposite way. Because with the hardware, you learn the fundamentals. So if I'm going to say, okay, here's how I'm doing this patch, they're physically seeing it, unless they're like spatially oriented and they can do it just by listening and then do it. But a lot of times it's you can show them, you can map it out for them, and then they can transfer that skill over. Okay. John? What about yourself or Tyler? Doesn't yeah, matter. It, 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 it is generational for sure. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm from the United Church and we don't have that many young people, but um, the ones that we do have are, are much more comfortable with with, uh, with software than hardware. The, and, and that was the other reason for, for kind of whittling things down and going software based was having everything, all the hardware devices spread out on this six foot wide table to run everything looked too intimidating for trying to bring in volunteers um, so simplifying the the uh the interface and running everything with the computer instead of having multiple devices um it, it's just more sellable for the volunteers but absolutely to answer, to answer your question it, there is very much a generational divide Tyler, you think the same thing or i think i think it's trainability um being stuck in a hardware box where software is so open and expandable very quickly, you learn to do things in a hardware unit that you might not think of in a software-based unit because it's just always there for you. Um, great example is using layers or in hardware, most hardware units called MEs. Um, you may only be stuck with one or two MEs on a hardware unit, whereas in software switching, you could have upwards of 10 to 11, maybe 12 different MEs that you can use. Um, but then when you have to switch back, you lose that ability to transfer the theory and the function because you're just so used to having a flexible system. Okay. So I'm gonna just, before we continue on, on, on the gear topic, um, I'm going to bring up a, a question about best practices because I've I've heard a couple number of times, not just from here, in other discussions I've had, where they're going, we're trying to scale down, bring everything into one or two pieces of equipment because we don't have volunteers, we don't have people, we don't have just availability. Um, and then so they keep going, how do we get more volunteers? So Mike. I've been I've helped out at a church that has a whole different mentality and that was they do how many people can we get involved so instead of having one person do the video directing the video switching and the graphics they'll expand that and they'll try and get 10 different people sitting at a massive table because now it includes 10 people and there's those people now are supposed to train somebody else. So one Sunday I saw 20 people sitting in the video department learning how to do video. And that did not include the four or five cameras that they had in operation. And I actually asked them, so they, why is that? And they, their whole opinion was the more people we have involved, the longer they will stay and they'll want to be involved and they'll tell other people who are going to bring other people out. So now if you have a teenager working, mom and dad now have to come. Oh, they're here. Can we get them in on the tech team? Can we get them doing ushers? Can we get them doing something else? So it's just a whole different thought process. Do you think that is a good thing or a bad thing? As everybody's pondering that. <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 I'll start with this one. So the more fingers on buttons, the better. 
Um, I personally think so. If I can spread the job across multiple people, it reduces stress. Um, it also reduces things getting missed because you have more eyes looking at something. Now, that being said, there is such thing as too many people. Um, you don't want to spread that too thin because what if a volunteer doesn't show up one Sunday or somebody gets sick and has to step aside? Right. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to run with too few people because then there isn't enough fingers to press buttons when things go wrong. So I think there's a delicate balance in there and it's, it's a learning curve for each organization or each church that they have to find that happy medium for what works for them. Do you guys have a thought on that? Um, yeah, no, I agree. I, I used to get in trouble with one of the children's church leaders because she, she felt like I was poaching her kids as soon as they graduated. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm... And it was like, oh, cool, new technology and whatever, and you get them going, and then, and then you get the next group in, the next group in, and then the entire thing is like, no, like, guys, like, you are going to spend some time back down in children's church doing sound for that and showing the next group and getting them involved in it and just trying to change that culture. Um, Daryl, I think you men mentioned Planet Shakers to me one time about what the worship team does and going back to, like, kids' yeah. church and other campuses and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, that does help. But at the same point, there, there is that danger that Tyler mentioned. Like, if I have... So Black Magic Design, the switcher has four tabs... Yeah, four tabs across the bottom. You got your switcher, you got your media, um, your media feed, you got your audio and your camera. So the, you could have four people in there, but man, I've messed up sometimes where guys are going whatever, and I see something's wrong and I hop in on another computer and I take control and I totally mess them up because they hit the command at the same time and stuff just, so yeah, you have to watch that and make sure no one oversteps their bounds. So that's really good when you have hardware base. So somewhere like you can't step in, you have to actually walk into the room and have a conversation <laughs> as it goes. <laughs> John, what's your opinion? Well, the um, the pandemic has, has caused a, a great deal of grief with getting volunteers because, of course, nobody was in the room. Um, but but since things loosened up a little bit, I do have a couple of volunteers that stepped in. So when I when I say um, my stuff is set up to, to run solo. Um, that's kind of legacy. <laughs> I do have a couple of volunteers now that which is which has been great. It's it's uh, it's wonderful to have a couple of volunteers. In fact, the last few Sundays, I just sit in the middle chair between them and just watch and make sure if something goes wrong, I can jump in and, and help out. But the two of them are actually running the show. So, um, but but to the the comment of um, you know having ten people learning how to do video, if we had ten people learning how to do video and the choir was still in there, we would only have 20 people left in the pews. Um, so, you know, th there's a there's a, a question of scale as well. So right. um, we just don't have a, a huge volunteer pool to draw from. Um, so I, I think with the three of us that are working it, I think we're doing fairly well as far as a percentage of the congregation actually being involved. Okay, that's good. I, I just figured when I saw that and I actually had that conversation, it was just interesting thought process everybody yeah, I, I keep reading it's like everybody's trying to scale down and keep it for one or two people and they're going no we're trying to figure out how we can make it bigger or include more people just mm -hmm. so that we it is be able to pass around but okay away from best practices um we were finishing talking about switchers um do we want to talk about computers for software or do we want to go into the software how about we go into a commercial break and give these guys a chance to breathe? <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> mm -hmm. GLI Hall is accepting new songs for their 2022 Christmas compilation. To find out how to submit your song, go to www.gmihub.ca today. GMI Hub Family Christmas Volume 3. Oh, 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 oh. All right, and back to the conversation. Maybe about audio this time? Oh, Cheryl wants to talk about audio. Okay, Cheryl, what's the question you have for the guys about audio? Speaker system. 
Microphones, is that better? How about mixers? Okay, let's go with yeah, mixers. Go that with sounds mixers. good. All okay. right. <laughs> mixers it is. Um, All right, so what's everyone's preferred mixer? Tyler likes Yamaha. Destiny Dominion <laughs> likes Allen and Heath. I'm going to guess John probably likes the X32 from Behringer. And Actually, were no, we I, correct? I, I, nope. Not but even close. close. <laughs> you were close with me. It is a Actually, Behringer, sorry. but it's, a, it's the XR16 that I use. Okay, sorry. Tyler will be Digico. Sorry, I'm wrong. Tyler will be yeah. Digico. Yeah. I know <laughs> you. I know you're a big Yamaha fan. <laughs> fan. I know you're a big Yamaha Yamaha fan, but yeah, it's Digico. That's right. Okay. So why would you choose the mixers that you choose uh, to uh, support the live stream? Let's put it to you that way. I I can start with this one. So for me, it was functionality and what I can do with it. Uh, also our scale and size. Um, we're upwards now of 45 inputs off the deck. Uh, that doesn't include any playback sources. So for us moving towards something really high end uh, gave us flexibility. We also split our audio three ways. So we split four front of house monitors and broadcast and uh, hopefully by the end of this month, we're going to be mixing our broadcast in a fully enclosed environment. Nice. And is that through Dante or? Yeah, so we're doing a split through Dante. Uh, all of our consoles have Dante cards in them. Uh, and we split digitally with our front of house being the master console. So broadcaster monitors can doesn't have to be relied on to be the master clock. So if we're not broadcasting, we don't have to have the broadcast console on. Um, that can go down on a whole another slippery slope, but um, our our best practice moving forward is going to be mixing our broadcast on a separate mixer from what our in room is. Okay. Okay, Martin, I'm going to pick on you. Why did why did you guys choose <laughs> Alan and Heath? I'm happy you said you guys because uh, I had no part to play in it. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's actually a lot of that was uh, the audio director. He was trying to be forward leaning, so uh, looking towards Dante. Like it's uh, been on his list, his to do list for at least I don't know five years now um, to build towards that, um, and we also allowed it, the price point let us to standardize across our campuses. So um, like the board that we we have our it's not completely isolated for mixing for our live stream uh, audio wise, but that board that we have there is the same type of board we have at our other campuses. Um, so going across the board and just making sure the mix evenly and all that um, means that it, it helps with the trainability. So if someone has done mixed sound at one of our campuses, they know how to mix on whatever board they're in front of. Um, we haven't moved up to the Dante yet, scanning the cards, moving forth with that. A um, couple of us are Dante certified, but yeah, it's just moving forward. Uh, a lot of it was f future friendly. It's not exactly rider friendly in North America, but if we were in Europe, it would be great. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's where we're at. Yeah. I will jump in this. That's the one thing I really like about the Allen and Heath is that um, actually in your camp, your main campus, I think there's three different boards, but they're all the same. Because I think there's yep. the seven, the five, and the three. Two fives and a seven. Two, okay, and you can take and mix and match. I actually threw Cohen off into a different room one day while the service was going on. I said, "Here, start mixing," and he could go in and mix, and I could see what he was doing and listen in on what he was doing. And then now I'm having him come sit with me at front of house, and he's actually guess what's going on because it's I believe it's a different board yeah that one's a different board than front of house so it's like but it's all familiar to them so you can like you said you can throw them from one room to another room to another room to a different campus which is great um, so that's there and John you're with the the Behringer series 
Yeah, I, I could have gone with the Soundcraft has a very similar um, device uh, and, and really it was the difference between the two was just budget. But my reason for choosing that one was infrastructure related. The Our Sanctuary was expanded in 2007 or 2006. Um, and at that time they replaced the speakers. Um, and the sound system, when I went out there, it was just, they just turned on the amp and that was it, nothing else, no controls, no soundboard, it just plugged, everything plugged into the amplifier. But there was nothing wrong with the amplifier and the speakers. So I introduced the the Behringer so that I could control the live sound and, and what was going to the live stream from the auxiliary without having to rewire a whole bunch of stuff because the, um, our old sanctuary is the, the, the amplifier and the, the mixer sit 65 feet up from my um, my tech station and I just run it from my iPad at the, the tech station. So choosing that particular um, device just allowed me to make use of the old technology, tie into it in, a, in an efficient way without having to do a whole lot of rewiring of the, uh, the system. So it was, it was more infrastructure based for me than anything else. Okay. Now, are you mixing uh, for the stream from where you're seated off of an aux, or is it just the, the yes. mains going out? Yep, auxiliary one is, is live stream, auxiliary two is the speakers for the, the choir loft, um, and then auxiliary three will be assistive listening whenever we get that implemented. But yeah, so we run the auxiliaries for that, and the, the live sound is just the, uh, the left and right. So do you have somebody sitting with in-ears or ears or headphones on top to uh to listen to the service or is it yeah we have we have headphones that monitor the the live stream and then the the room sound of course we're in the room so right. it, it's less than ideal i would love to be able to do the live stream from somewhere isolated from the room sound but we just don't we don't have the space to do that okay so let me ask this question and that is what's the biggest thing that you can that uh i'll call it average well for the church that you represent would need to do to up the next level or for the person who wants to go to the level you're at need to do to their sound system are you still with me sure yep we can go with okay. you since you're here that's fine <laughs> okay um the the biggest thing is is not to expect that the and, and this seems obvious to most of us i think but not to expect that just feeding the same sound that goes into the the room is going to do your live stream but it needs to be an entirely different mix. Um, and and if your system doesn't allow you to do that, then you need to replace whatever components will allow you to set up a, an auxiliary feed um, specifically for the live stream. That's the biggest the biggest thing in my opinion. Okay. Martin? Um, all right, so Alan and Heath. Um, Alan and Heath has the S-Lake, so it's different than Dante. So it's um, point to point network. Uh, so our various soundboards, we actually, when we were streaming last year, we had uh, our front of house was down on the ground in front of what, 40 feet in front of a 40 foot trailer. And then we were mixing the monitors up on top of stage and I'm running, I'm ru and, and then the, the live stream was actually running out from what's ordinarily our front of house and then being brought into the switcher right beside me. And yeah, that was, that was a fun thing. Um, but you have to at least have an idea of how your audio is flowing because I've had issues where everyone's like, hey, the audio is running ahead of the video and making the changes or whatever. What can you do to tighten that up? Um, what can you, we don't have to make the immediate jump to Dante. Like I said, you could be certified in it, whatever. You don't have to make that jump. Our next big thing for audio is going to be Dante. Um, we just have, our church is moving um in the next month and a half and then hopefully there'll be more budget room to move to dante and do other stuff that we need to do if we want to move to the next level like tighten up our network and stuff like that so we can we can be more on target and i have less this computer is so slow so that's my two cents okay i'm going to change the question a little bit to you tyler um because I wasn't going to pick on Martin because I know Martin's not an audio guy. But <laughs> I, I know I know a number of times, I'm sure you've heard it, maybe not at, at the church you're at, but uh, working on shows or whatever else or smaller churches and helping them, they're going, 
What can we, we do to fix our vocals? Because they're so off. Is the pitch correction a legitimate way to do that? Or is it a monitor mix so that they can actually work, listen better to their ears so that they can get on pitch? What's your opinion? This is going to sound so bad considering we're talking about a church market right now, but it starts with the source. Um, Thank you. Thank I, you. <laughs> I think, I think, I think getting your vocalist some training, uh, finding maybe a local studio or vocal school that you could work out something with to come and do some training is a huge benefit. Um, things like in ears, getting vocalists to, to mix their in ears correctly. Again, that goes back to training. And then getting into things where you're looking at like auto tune, um, it I think it becomes then too much of a crutch. If your singers know it's there, they'll just rely on it and become sloppy. Um, even though it's gotten really, really, really good since the old Antreas hardware days, um, yeah. And then and then it comes down to mixing, and and how to how to balance that, especially for a live stream. Um, because what you want to put out through your house system, your house system may hide some things the way it's tuned that the broadcast will hear. So it's finding that happy medium if you're mixing all in one console or if you're in two consoles, um, really just getting down to EQ and compression and making sure you've got a good solid mix going out. Okay. Well, wow. I know, Daryl, you said I'm not an audio guy, but and I know you've done this, Daryl, but has anyone else, while you've been at the board, mimed pushing someone's volume up while you're pretty much doing the opposite? <laughs> <laughs> I've done it too. I'm just laughing at Daryl's like, okay, yeah. But yeah no, 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 I've never talking. done it. They usually say, as I'm reaching for the knob, oh, it sounds perfect. That's, that's the better one. It's like, you haven't even done anything. I haven't even made the move yet, and they've gone, it's perfect, it's perfect, just the way I want it, just the way I need it. Okay. But if anybody it, from my church is listening, you're always unmuted. Unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about yeah. bearing in the mix. We won't talk, no, we won't do, we won't get into that on air. Um, <laughs> boy, oops. Um, let's see, I'm just going I'll through some questions it. here. Um, 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 so how much time do you, does, do you or your team sprint spend, um, jumping off of the audio a little bit here, but it could relate to audio. How much time do you spend running through your content or your program before your service starts or your show, if it's a special or something to that effect? Depends on the content. So, um, our video packages are they're previewed a couple times. Our audio, well, our video stream starts 50 minutes before the service. It used to be half hour, just to work out all the kinks. That way, if we're hearing that the audio is not coming back through or any issues, we can work it out during the pre-roll. Um, our worship team, they they do two rehearsals, so they do a full rehearsal Thursday nights for the following Sunday and the following Wednesday, as well as uh, Saturday morning, no Sunday morning. At like nine oh five, they're they're going ahead doing a quick rehearsal for their their set. Um, our audio guys, technicians, are running through the microphones, doing everything. Um, me personally, I might do another run through Saturday just to make sure that everything that I'm responsible for is just taken care of. That after people have cleaned stuff, whatever, that everything is in the condition it needs to be for the next day. Okay. Tyler, how long do you or your team spend running through uh, this pre-service? I think it varies. It varies on the Sunday because we have Sundays where we add extra video content. We have some Sundays um, where we don't have as much video content. We do a standard graphics package for our quarter. Uh, they get loaded once, so we're not having to review that all the time. Um, videos, anything shot the week before always gets watched all the way through before it hits our streaming computer. 
uh, or our playback machine, and then we do a full run through of it morning of to make sure it's going to play out okay. Um, special events, we'll run our rehearsals like actual show, so it could be anywhere from one to two days to a couple weeks if we're talking Christmas or Easter, and depending on the complexity. But all of our teams are involved in our rehearsals. So that way our rehearsal feels like the service. Okay. John, how long do you and your team rehearse for? Well, ours, ours is a very simple, by comparison, a very simple um, setup, but the, um, the, the choir comes in and rehearses from 10 till 1045 for the 11 o'clock service. We make sure the tech team is there at the same time. So if there's a, if there's a solo piece or anything where um, we've got a couple of voices that can reach um, peaks that you wouldn't believe, um, if that happens, we need to be there to actually know that that's coming up so that we can, uh, we can be ready for it. So we're, we're there at the same time the choir is rehearsing. That's perfectly adequate. Um, if there are anything um, like the, the, the youth group has prepared a video or anything like that, it gets played well in advance. We make sure that it actually freaking well runs. Um, so we're not surprised on Sunday morning. Um, but other than that, that, that pretty much covers us. Okay. So, I got a question. Yep, go for it. All right, so I used to have someone who'd come up like, 20 minutes into the service, be like, oh, the senior pastor wants you to throw this up on the screen or pull this down. <laughs> I I told them finally that that was the last time and never to do that ever again. I won't say what level that's why they don't, they were That's why they don't allow us to be armed. <laughs> um, yeah, like, it, it's because it's like, that. that's like, it's like, no, we need to know in advance, like, if we're... Like, cause we were on a windows PC doing, I think it was easy worship or pro presenter when they were trying to do that. And it's like, you don't know the amount of chaos you're throwing into this mix at this point in time, because as we devote the time to pull down this package and get it up onto the computer, we're not, we're not, the slides aren't advancing and everyone's glancing back here and wondering what's wrong. Yeah. So I'm throwing that out there as a question, like how else do you guys handle that? As well as letting anyone who's made the mistake understand just how big a problem it is and let a foreigner tell them that so actually here's what you can do this is actually this will help you martin for next time if that happens and you look at the person you go back to and say uh, can you hit me up (laughs) because um yeah and what you can tell them is i will put that up if i had the other input so we can put another computer on so if you can allow me to purchase the switcher for next time <laughs> i will gladly make that happen as we stumble through because now we can show that we're needing to advance our video rig i would do that if i had dante because then you can just throw in another audio source right into the board or whatever but if right. i have another computer and you can't do that even then it's a service because i could have another laptop but there's gonna be no audio but yeah yep. um Right, guys, I, I, go ahead. I would just throw that because everybody, all the all the tech are always looking for an excuse to get something. So I would just throw it at them and going, we'll make it work this time, but we might have some issues. So just open up the funds so we can get, buy some more gear. We always love more gear. Um, okay, so what do you do when somebody shows up and says, hey, can you add this to the, the set? Or we have a special musician coming in who's playing with uh, two guitars and a keyboard instead of track. What's how, how do you handle that? We're pretty locked down on our, our service. So uh, most of our, our video packages to us by Friday evening um, for review to check for any encoding errors. And then for Sunday mornings, the band doesn't really change. If we have to nix a member there, we'll try to make it up in a track somewhere. Um, because things do fluctuate and change there. But if, if we've hit that stream button and or it's 10 minutes to stream, it's too bad, so sad, you should have submitted Friday night. Um, because then it allows the production team time to react to anything that was produced during the week. So we don't do last minute. Okay. Okay. John, what about you? Um, I very seldom actually get the request last minute because they have learned what the responses are like. Um, so that they don't want to upset things right before the service. So that I, I never get anything, 
any any less than maybe an hour before the service and and that allows me time if if something if i can't make it work within an hour then i'll just tell them no didn't happen and and that 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 is pretty much it so no that they, they uh that that hasn't really been a problem we we uh they, they've they're they're pretty good about accommodating tech and and not trying to to uh force me to do things i don't want to do so the greatest tech send i've ever seen is where a tech team member is requesting stuff on friday that they could have asked for on monday for sunday and it's like oh let me drop everything and get that done but go ahead <laughs> daryl i was gonna say so so I, man i gotta watch how i say this this can flame is pretty good um <laughs> So the movement of the spirit doesn't uh, coincide because you know somebody's going to say this. So I'll say it. So the the God can't move and, and change because somebody decided that they really needed to change the service. It is what it is. It doesn't change. We don't have a special guest because God said, hey, you know what? Let's get this special person up. And I'm kind of being tongue in cheek there because I'm kind of... I kind of like the flexibility of letting things happen, but I also believe that there needs to be a hard no at times. Um, you know what? I'm going to stretch out. I'm going to, I'm going to handle this. So, um, we actually have a production meeting that does like first 10 minutes. It just debriefs the last service and we're constantly building on best practices, what we've we done, whatever. And so we have the lead pastors there. And so we'll talk and we'll be like, yeah, when this happened, this causes, and then he'd be more mindful of making sure the message is passed correctly. Um, so we have like the production manager, all the other people. So we're sort of aware of it and work on it, but I can see that as a problem because I've had it where uh, we had a guest speaker came in and they just love this one singer and calls her up and we had done no EQ, nothing with her. And it's just cold. And yeah, it, it that can be a mess. Okay, so we'll just leave that. We'll leave that um, <laughs> because I think we all agree there needs to be a time limit where it is a no um, for best practices. So I'm going to hit a little question here. Again, I'm looking at my uh, questions that we're going to try and run through. We are actually sort of getting close to time. Um, if an average church walks up and uh, call it 250, 300 people. I'll call that an average size church in Canada. And they're going to go, we want to upgrade from our cell phone with a feed into it. What should we budget? And what gear should we get? Um, I'll let each of you guys list off what you think you should get or what they should move to. <laughs> So going from a cell phone to the uh, next level, 300 people. John, um, do you want to try handling this one? Yeah, I can jump in. <laughs> There's, I, I tend to, because, because I, I mainly am involved with the United Church, it tends to be smaller, somewhat more rural churches. Um, so budget is, is always tight. For something in the six thousand dollar range, we can build a good, solid streaming system. Um, as long as I mean, if we're if we're adding projection and all that as well, but just just to to stream, just to take them to the a, a really good professional stream, um, I can do it in that range, and that's usually what I what I try and, and budget. And and usually, um, depending on the the volunteer pool, um, it'll be a low end video switcher um I, I don't want to say the name but it'll be a, one of the the inexpensive ones um although i i do i actually like buying a, a desktop computer with a, a multi-input um so it, it really it, it it depends on the church the configuration the layout but i usually do one pdz camera and one fixed box camera that's just a, a static wide shot that you can go to while you're moving the robotic um, just so you're not you're not moving a, a live uh, robotic camera um, and and that to me is is sort of baseline to go to a, a professional show is is that that price range and and two cameras okay 
Tyler Martin, do you want to wait in on this? If I were I to think John do it kinda... all over again. Go ahead, Tyler. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I think John hit it right on the head. Right about that six grand point would be the sweet spot. Uh, getting yourself one or two cameras, probably a decent capture card with a good switcher, um, and a decent computer to run your stream from. Like, it. it all really comes down to in the end about like what we talked about last time about what kind of online experience do you want to build and building your equipment purchase towards that experience so whereas six thousand might be good for one organization other organizations might be looking at twelve twenty thirty thousand dollars to get into streaming um yeah. but at the end of the day if the $1,000 solution is what's going to take your stream to the next level, then that's the right fit for your organization. Right. Okay. Martin, you were going to say something. If I, I was going to say, if I were to do it all over again, so I'm sitting in the old production booth. This is where I'm actually on a computer that our producer does all the switching from. And so I'm looking, I can see a whole bunch of monitors in front of me, and I can see our iMag displays up on this like in my peripheral vision and that's what the original setup was was about imag first and then switching second and it comes down to what like again what is your priority um what's funny about the imag displays is they're actually taking this the feed that's going up to the stream the streaming um just because budget constraints so originally it was everything for imag first and then to the stream now it's like everything's composed for the stream and the people in the in the audience get to just see what's going on on the stream and it puts certain limitations on it so it's come like get a complete idea of what do you want um sometimes it's not even look at all the, everything that the system can do write down what you want and then look at what things can do um we don't do we don't put up certain like those in like those messages like a um a 62 your child is needs you because that's going to wind up on the stream just because of the nature of the setup but um we can have yeah six thousand dollars is a good start um because six thousand dollars that get that you, you're going to wind up with the computer either you're going to have pci express to bring it in or you're gonna have Thunderbolt 3 and a Sonic dock and you're off to the races. Um, Cause then you can put in whatever capture card you want. Um, it's, yeah, and it's not that complicated because if you type in um, church live stream or whatever guides, there's YouTube guides on here and they give the recommendations. Of course, a lot of time they say black magic, black magic, black magic. And it's just <laughs> the warning guys, black magic, it's good for what it does. Just plan on buying two because it's either going to be to do a good enough job that you're going to get another one because it's that cheap or at some point in time, it's going to fail on you. It's guaranteed. Um, but if you, if you buy it from the right person, you'll just swap it for you. At the same point, I have a decimator beside me that's Daryl's and a couple up down crosses that I can see and just the limitations on those things. I daisy chain them so I could get stuff done. So make it that way you want. Okay. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna move to one more question and software that you guys use for streaming, as in for your graphics or your lyrics, your playbacks. Um, John, I'll start with you. Okay. Yeah, we use uh, we use Easy Worship for the projection. Um, Easy Worship sends out a, a, an NDI output that goes into vMix, so I can do the overlays as an, uh, an NDI input, um, which is why I actually switched from using OBS. Originally, that was my, my streaming software. Um, but, but it doesn't handle um, the, the overlays quite as cleanly as vMix does. I mean, you get what you pay for, and, and vMix is a paid product. So it, it, to me, was just a little bit cleaner. So I, I use Easy Worship feeding into vMix. vMix does all my camera switching, um, and, and then we just superimpose the, uh, the lyrics over top, uh, those two. Okay. I'm going to jump to Martin. Software. Um, 
software. All right, so we use the, well, okay. So we use ProPresenter. We used to use Easy Worship. Um, ProPresenter just slipped ahead. There was a lot more things I could do with ProPresenter at that point in time when we made the switch, especially with the campus licenses. Um, we do use OBS in-house for some things we do. And then there's some, we'll just say I abuse NDI in-house. Um, and NDI Tools 5 right now. Um, what other software? There's lots of other software we use, but those are like the main things. Um, and then you can always watch the last video to hear about the other things we use. And then for our encoder, Boxcaster Pro, for the most part. Although those cameras we have, the 6350s, will stream on their own too. Okay. And Tyler. So. Uh, let's go with flow here. So we are a pro presenter house, um, renewed vision. They just, they're ahead of everyone else right now. Um, and like Martin said, with the campus licensing, um, if you need more instances, it becomes more affordable. Um, and then tracking back, we are a full NDI setup through and through. So all our cameras send NDI to us. Uh, and then we receive that into vMix. Um, vmix for its feature set and support um, but i have used things like obs wirecast um, gone to hardware encoders from companies like epiphone using their pearl mini so it it really depends for us what we're trying to get done that day like we have a, a mobile streaming rig that runs obs versus vmix because we don't want to pick up a second license of vmix so it's it's a mixture of kind of everything to to build our composition. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Cheryl, do you have any questions for the guys? Have you learned everything you need to know on the tech side, what you need to do to get a good setup for your live stream? Is this what we I have in the I'm... house? <laughs> I think I've learned quite a bit and I don't know if we have everything. I don't think we have everything that the gentlemen have mentioned, but uh, certainly a good start. <laughs> I certainly think we do. I think we're not doing too badly on our end, considering we're not streaming for a 300 uh, audience. 300. Well, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. No, we are streaming for the entire world. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> but guys, this has been a great conversation. I am learning a lot about, uh, I learned the right question about audio, that's for sure. <laughs> asking about mixers, cameras, switchers, software, and and uh, the different, um, I guess the different needs, like understanding what the different equipment would be for the different needs of the different churches um, and different church sizes from small to medium to large. So this has been really great. I hope you all feel like you've covered a lot because I think there has been a lot that has been covered. and. I'm so thankful that you are here to join us, uh, that you joined us. So thank you so much again, Tyler, John, and Martin for being here with us to share your, your insights. Daryl, thank you for asking all the questions so I didn't have to. And <laughs> thank you, Cohen, for switching tonight. This is, now you've been talking about volunteers and, and we have our 13-year-old vo volunteering tonight was doing the switching. So, hey, if you enjoyed the switching, do a thumbs up, send us a comment. That would be awesome. Um, again, if you want to know more about GMI Hub online or GMI Hub, go to our website, gmihub.ca, where you will uh, learn all about what our intentions are, our, our projects that we're working on, and even what's going to be showing up on GMI Hub online. And also you have the opportunity to join our community and be the first to learn about some different endeavors that GMI Hub is looking into doing. Uh, follow us on our web uh, on our website. Follow us on our social medias, be it Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter, and TikTok. You'll find some uh, interesting little posts there. Uh, also, here, right here on YouTube. Please, if you like what you're seeing, click the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the bell so that you know when we are are going to be airing another live program. All that to simply say, I'm so glad that you're able to watch us. 
tonight and I hope you learned a lot. Feel free to click and share this link when you have it, uh, just to share it to anyone who you know would benefit from this conversation. In the meantime, we want you to know that GMI Hub is here for you. So if you have any comments or questions, if you want to send us, drop us a line at, con at uh, contact at gmihub.ca. Just go to our website and hit our contact page and if you want to drop us a line, let us know how we're doing. Let us know what we can do to help you or help your part of the industry. That would be so awesome. Uh, in the meantime, though, we will uh, be back next week, back talking about songwriting. And we are so thrilled we're going to be having Jalene Johnson, who is a songwriter and a songwriting coach, as well as John... Uh, John uh, Oh gosh, I was going to say John Bedell, but that's the person that's here tonight. <laughs> John Buller is going to be here tonight, uh, next week, who is an award-winning singer, songwriter, recording artist. Uh, and they're both going to be talking about songwriting in terms of praise and worship music. So I uh, thank you again. I look forward to next week seeing you back here with us. Remember, GMI Hub is here to serve you. And we want you to have a good week. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.